Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this People Resolutions webcast. I'm Natalia Baker. Just a little bit about us, uh, People Resolutions, we provide conflict management services to clients of all sizes and sectors throughout the UK, from mediations and investigation to training and consulting. Over the years, mediation has grown into becoming one of our core products today, and we've worked with hundreds of organisations when working relationships have broken down. We thought it was time to take stock of what we've learned and uh, share it with other HR professionals exploring the use of mediation within their organisations. We're going to touch on some very common questions and some misconceptions to help you move forward from today with a really clear idea of what mediation is and what it sets out to do. Okay, first things first. Let me walk you through the screen layout that you see, you're seeing in front of you. If a question pops up in your mind while we're talking, please type it into that Q&A box in the bottom left corner uh, that you can see on your screen and on the slide there. And that's going to be collected by our panel members for answering at the end. Feel free to do this at any point during the presentation. Also, uh, if you want to indicate to the presenter, which I, I believe somebody may have done with me, which is to speak a bit louder, um, one of the options is to increase the volume on your speakers to make sure they're coming through to your headphones or speakers correctly. Um, but just to uh, indicate anything else to the, to the presenters, click on that uh, icon with the, the man with his hand raised and then you can indicate various things. Okay, so I hope I'm speaking loud enough. Uh, one final thing to say before we properly begin is that we are recording the webcast and we'll be distributing both the recording and the slides following today. So please don't feel like you have to write too many notes. And to those who've registered online or are attending the webcast, uh, you're going to be the first to receive hot off the press our accompanying digital guide to mediation. We're going to be emailing that to you as a PDF by the end of this week, so stay tuned for that. Okay, let me briefly introduce you to our presenters. So walking you through the concept of mediation in general and its importance in resolving workplace conflict is our general manager, Robert Peirce. And Robert has 35 years of experience in human resources management. He's an alumnus of the Henley Management College and a member of the Occupational Psychology Division of the British Psychological Society. Linda Hoskinson will take over from Robert to talk in more detail about what constitutes good mediation and she'll be offering some insight into some of the skills that our mediators draw upon during the actual mediation process. Linda founded People Resolutions 13 years ago and she's got a wealth of experience in managing conflict fueled by a passion to help employees work more collaboratively together. She's qualified internationally as CEAP and was the first president of the Employee Assistance Programs Association. And I'll be wrapping up the presentation part of the webcast with a case study example and a bit more about where mediation fits into an overall conflict strategy. I'm an account manager with People Resolutions and I spend a lot of my time talking with clients to understand their employee issues. And while each case, I think, poses a very different set of challenges to overcome, there are common threads running through them all, and, and those are the ones that we're going to be addressing today. Finally, we'll wrap up with a 15-minute Q&A session. And so we're looking forward to seeing some of your questions, as they already have done, uh, thank you very much, coming through during the presentations, and we'll be answering them at the end. Without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Robert Peirce. Good afternoon, everyone. Poorly managed conflict costs British employers £24 billion every year, according to OPP and CIPD research. Our own research indicates that over a quarter of HR professionals spend as much as a day a week, that's more than 45 working days a year, on conflict, on workplace conflict, and that's equivalent to between £8,500 and £10,000 each per year. Government is now actively encouraging us to use mediation, thereby avoiding costly and stressful grievances and employment tribunals. 
Now, more than ever, UK businesses of all sectors are starting to put mediation at the centre of their conflict management procedures and acknowledging the enormous value that it can bring to their people and the organisation. Good mediation, coupled with the appropriate support measures and an accurate assessment of the conflict scenario, can transform individuals, teams and even cultures within a very short period of time and ensure the cost savings of resolving the issue are achieved before the next increasingly costly formal stages. However, there is an appropriate way of using mediation in the workplace and a risk of wasting the opportunity or even making the situation worse if it is not used properly. For 13 years now, we've helped to resolve employee relationship breakdowns through professional mediation. By sharing with you some of what we've learned along the way, we hope you'll be equipped with the key considerations to bear in mind before introducing mediation into your organisation. We hope you find this guide enhances your knowledge of mediation best practice and that your colleagues may also find it useful. <coughs> Workplace conflict can arise for many reasons, including perceived discrimination, jealousy over a promotion, underperformance, incompatible working styles or personalities, opposing targets, or returning to work interventions. Whatever the issue, mediation, which is also known as Alternative Dispute Resolution, or ADR, can provide a quick, pain-free, and cost-effective way of resolving matters. So what is mediation? Mediation is an informal dispute resolution process facilitated by an impartial trained mediator aimed at bringing two or more parties together to clear up misunderstandings, explore concerns and reach an amicable solution. So first steps. When conflict boils over in the workplace, it's tempting to quickly bring the parties together and point them towards a resolution. You can see how they need to work it out. It's just a matter of telling them, right? No, not really. A more sensitive approach, based on our current knowledge of interpersonal relationships, usually gets better results, which are more relevant to the individuals and longer lasting. Time and again, we come across well-meaning but perhaps ill-advised colleagues confusing informal HR meetings with mediation in its most valuable and effective form. Perhaps it's time for HR professionals and line managers to gain a better understanding of what mediation is, what it can do, when it should be used, and who is best placed to mediate competently and without bias. After all, the way mediation is introduced into your organisation will shape the way it is embraced and embedded in your culture. Once the relevant line or HR manager has learned of a conflict situation at work, they will probably want to sit down with each party to gain a fuller picture of the situation. There's much to be gained from these conversations, and one possible outcome may be to propose a mediation. Problems occur when the meeting turns into the beginnings of a mediation of sorts, before the parties have been duly prepared and have an understanding of just what is involved. There is also a risk that in this context there is a lack of complete impartiality and that professional mediation practice models are not being followed. This poses a significant risk to the credibility of the process and the way the parties are being supported. If we position mediation positively, then we've given a good resolution a real chance. When employees are at loggerheads, mindsets can become fixated on being right above anything else or having their day in court. Bristling with indignation and defensive, the parties are often far from seeking out a way to address the real issues at the heart of the conflict. It follows that when mediation is introduced without proper preparation, 
sometimes with a formal investigation in the background, it is not surprising if there is uncertainty and resistance. A new process, such as mediation, particularly if it is not set out within your policies, can arouse suspicion when offered. Parties may assume the organisation is trying to brush the issue or issues under the carpet, or reroute it away from formal proceedings. And some issues may be partially addressed by the initial one-to-one -one meetings. What's in it for them, they may ask. It takes careful positioning to help each individual buy into the spirit of mediation, to consider what they might personally gain from it, and to agree to take part with an open mind. Those involved need to know that the mediation process is completely voluntary, confidential, neutral, and without prejudice. And I'll now hand you over to Linda. Hello everyone, uh, good afternoon. Um, now a few moments on how mediation actually works. Um, if we're positioning mediation in our organisation, this is quite useful. Um, I can't stress enough some individual pre-meetings with the mediator and both parties privately to begin with. Sometimes we put people together in the afternoon for the actual mediation, but the mediation process really has started in the morning when people get an opportunity to meet the mediator them for themselves. During that process, um, they get to meet each other as people. Uh, individuals get to relax a little bit about who this mediator actually is. Uh, the mediator gets an opportunity to reassure the parties that they're trained, impartial, and that the process is voluntary. They can also deal with a few practicalities. The mediator can recheck their understanding of the process, um, what good behaviour is expected during the process, and offer reassurance and explain about confidentiality and any boundaries. Um, just a word of, of warning here, if you're using the word confidentiality in this situation, it is confidential, but please don't say it's 100% confidential because in certain situations where harm might be to others outside of the process <clears throat> or some embezzlement is taking place, you might have to agree that action might be taken even if it's a limited action. So we tend to say it's a confidential process, not completely confidential. We don't use that phrase, uh, but then uh, we explain and this early meeting is a good, good opportunity to deal with all sorts of issues and practicalities. The main benefit of, of a pre-meeting is that the mediator will ask what has led to this situation and it might actually be the first time that uh, the individual has had a chance to tell the story in an uninterrupted fashion and be heard and many people have said that um, they have come to these early sessions with a great deal of anger and frustration or emotion, um, but by the time they've told their story, briefly, but told their story to the mediator, they feel calmer and in a better space for moving forward. So um, it frees up some individual energy. It also gives the mediator an opportunity to encourage some letting go, looking forward, not backwards, and it can improve the energy and the motivation for going forward. It also begins, some people are very good at thinking about their goals, what they want out of the mediation itself. Other people might need a little help to develop some um, sensible goals arising from their personal situations. Um, mediators have always said to me, and they're trained in how to motivate people to enjoy and get the best out of a mediation. Uh, if you can get people, Linda, to this process, I'll do the rest. And it is my experience that most mediators are sunny, upbeat, and very optimistic, and usually do get very magical results. So what do mediators do? It isn't magic, of course it isn't. Um, they do a number of things. They create a safe environment. They remind people together about the ground rules, uh, what's acceptable behaviour, no interrupting, listening carefully and respectfully, no fighting, yes, it needs to be said, 
and that mediation usually works. Again, the optimistic uh, message shines through. They offer to take charge of the process and they confirm that they will um, encourage sharing and pause or halt the situation to dis diffuse negative behaviour or give more thinking time. They get the parties talking, gently perhaps to begin with. They set the tone respectfully. They manage anger, distress, and they've earned the right by then to challenge any avoidance or inconsistencies. They generally nudge the process forward towards improved understanding. They invite people to clarify statements and sometimes they get the opportunity to reframe some statements to soften them. For example, one party might say, I was absolutely fuming. And the mediator might get an opportunity later to uh, summarize a few points and say, it sounds as though you were disappointed by John's reaction. And if you get a yes to that, you've actually diffused and brought down a level some of the um, uh, emotion. They go on and understand. Um, uh, they, they, want, they deal with people's goals, uh, agree um, what they want out of the situation, and they test reality. Sometimes people come with a long list of wants and it may be impractical so they need to prioritize a bit sometimes people come with a uh, an impractical requirement like i never want to speak to that person ever again when actually they've got to work together so a more realistic objective might be that they, we will talk to each other politely during working hours um, so the mediator attends to reasonable goals then they plan action then they agree what is private and what can be shared afterwards and with whom. Um, and they write an agreement between them and they sign it and they take a copy away usually, each of them. But this may not be the summary that the organisation gets. Mediators are very aware that the organisation needs some feedback but they agree with the parties what that should be. The organisation of course needs to know is this resolved, how resolved, how improved, and what should happen next from the organization's point of view. Um, so it sounds simple, doesn't it? But in actual fact, it's quite a skilled process. If anyone listening is uh, thinking of undertaking mediation, do get training so that you can handle this process with confidence. It can be very bumpy. It can be very emotional. Um, and. Um, uh, there is a personal and psychological component to this. One of my best gurus says that we, great, we regain 30% of our energy when we stop fighting, another 30% when we arrive at a settlement, and another 30% when we resolve how we will handle disagreements in the future. The final 10% is returned only when we are able to forgive and let go. And this is where good mediators earn their weight in gold. Mediation is not unique. Um, sorry, mediation is unique. There are other uh, meetings. Um, there are other meetings which it is not. It's not a meeting with your line manager, as Robert has said, or with HR. It's not an investigation. It's not a formal component of the grievance process. And it's not a meeting with your staff representative or a lawyer. Some of you will know about discovery in law and uh, that tribunals and courts can ask you, the organisation, for any information that was used or summarised in a meeting if it was part of your formal process. So you can't offer mediation as confidential and private unless you make sure it's not part of your formal process. So the best thing to do is if you um, have a grievance already on the table, is to get the agreement of all the parties to pause the formal process to give mediation an opportunity outside of the process, in parallel, as it were. Mediation um, gives the parties an opportunity to retain control of the outcome. If you look at all those meetings higher up on the slide, um, if you enter into them as one of the parties, you can't control the outcome. Your line manager might have a view as HR might. For example, in an investigation, um, an investigation might have implicated the behaviour of someone who is then disciplined when the aggrieved person may only have wanted the poor behaviour to stop 
so they've lost control of the process. So mediation is unique and it's very uh, valuable and is empowering. Retaining the control of the outcome is key here. After the storm, whatever storm, uh, mediation helps with moving on, with understanding, with goodwill, and most people say, I've now got the skills to avoid this next time. So you can use mediation after a mediation as a follow-up. Behaviour can be hard to change. You can promise that you, you won't do this anymore or you will do that instead, and, and, and then you have to go away and live it. And sometimes two weeks, six weeks, whatever, after a mediation, a follow-up, if you can afford it, is again worth its weight in gold. It helps to consolidate changes that people have promised. Uh, also, after a formal grievance and an investigation, where most people have been giving evidence, uh, positioning their own uh, corner strongly in some cases, um, there may be a lot of tension around and people have been looking backwards for long enough, reviewing the evidence. So moving forward, um, uh, it might be very constructive for everyone involved to have some relationship rebuilding and you would need to think carefully about who the mediations would need to be between, but they, they um, uh, certainly put the relationship on a new footing, ready to move forward. And of course, there is always some organisational action to follow. Um, do make sure that you've learned from the mediator and the parties what, the what they would like the organisation to do. Removing some of the triggers that has caused the trouble would be a good idea. For, for example, um, there was a bonus scheme that was so tightly managed that it was um, uh, um, triggering conflict between people who were um, targeting the same bonus. Uh, also, um, in a legal department, the, the early birds arriving had to do the court duty um, and we're beginning to complain about it. Now that's a systems thing to change so that the early birds don't always get to do the same duties and that's something for the organisation to attend to. So over to you Natalia now for the next part of the process here. Thank you. Thank you Linda. And just to reiterate at this point that if you do have some questions that you want to ask, um, we've had lots of questions through already, thank you for those. Um, that Q&A button's in the bottom left. If you type something in there, it won't be seen by everybody else, but it will reach um, our administration end and we will be covering all of those questions at the end. So at this point, uh, I just want to take a step back out of mediation um, and up to a higher level view of what tools you have in your armory of conflict resolution and also how to approach tackling conflict in the first place. So step one, we like to call these the five A's. And one is acknowledge that there's tension or conflict that needs addressing rather than letting it fester any longer. It's really natural for us to want to avoid and downplay conflict because dealing with it is hard. It does take effort and, and to some extent honesty and it can bring things out that can make the situation more uncomfortable before it improves. So the first step is critical, and that's taking ownership of the problem. Secondly, what is it you actually want to achieve from putting yours and others' time and energy and financial investment into dealing with the conflict? What we mean by this is, are you looking to address the underlying issues at the very heart of the conflict? Or can you see other ways that the situation could be brought to some sort of closure? That might be moving someone to another department, if that's possible could be reaching a compromise agreement, could be conducting an investigation to tick a particular policy box. And your answer to this question, it fundamentally affects what action you take and how the conflict may or may not be resolved. In our experience, if you can get to the root of the issue, it always yields the most positive and cost-effective result for the business and the individuals concerned. Step three, Addressing conflict early is always going to be the best approach before it escalates to a point where it becomes increasingly costly to resolve. For example, reaching employment tribunal is a situation where nobody really wins. Your aim is to nip conflict in the bud as soon as it's picked up, and I'll talk more about this in a minute. Four, 
try not to jump to solution mode before you've assessed some key factors. You've got to look at why the conflict occurred, the seriousness of the conflict and the type. With a group conflict situation, it might be helpful to try and visualise the conflict, uh, maybe writing down on paper. You could represent the, the lines of interaction between each individual and what the relationship was like, maybe where incidents have occurred between people and, and therefore you're pulling out some of the hot spots to tackle first. And lastly, it's really important to accept that some kinds of conflict are easier to resolve than others. So a spat in a meeting could be diffused relatively quickly, but trying to resolve the issues that are bubbling underneath uh, the, the one-off event could be a lengthier road. Um, it's certainly possible if you've made that commitment to see it through at step one, to support the individuals through what can really be quite a tough period of dealing with negative emotions, some self-reflection and changing behaviours. So I hope that's a helpful framework. So what are your options now that you're ready to tackle conflict? And for the purposes of time on this webcast, we've lay laid out five of the key approaches to tackling group conflict. And the key thing to note is that although they roughly fall on this spectrum of informal to formal action, you can actually employ them at any point in the process. Uh, it's not a prescriptive order. And of course, it depends on, on how, well, it actually depends on how prescriptive your policies are, but because they would come first. And none of these tools is likely to be your silver bullet, uh, but you can achieve genuine resolution through a combination of, each, of these interventions, uh, either employed in conjunction with each other or at different times to individuals or to sub-relationships within the group. And they can flex as the situation changes and evolves over time. So now we know what tools are available, how do we know which to use and when? We've all heard or used the, the unfortunate term headache employee. Uh, we get calls like this all the time from, from HR professionals uh, referring to an, an individual who poses a, partic a particular challenge to the business. They tend to crop up in more than one conflict situation. I'm sure you can think of someone in your own mind. They might be absolutely a stellar performer in every aspect of their job but there's something about their personality or communication style that's putting off a number of people working with them. You don't want to lose them, neither do you want to lose others, so how should we proceed? I wanted to look at an example that you might recognise in principle. Have a look at this case study. A finance director with a seemingly over-assertive management style has upset uh, several members of her team, some of whom have approached HR to informally flag the issue. The director is extremely good at her job and believes that others are being too sensitive. No one has yet raised a grievance, but there has been a recent flare-up between the director and one direct report, and another has resigned, citing the director in their exit interview. The chief executive is aware of the situation, but hasn't yet taken any action. So what we've got here are several working relationships affected, uh, no doubt having a negative impact on morale within pretty much the entire finance department and there are political sensitivities here with a senior level individual at the centre. It's really important to say at this point that there's no absolute single right way to resolve the situation. Um, what we need to do is drill down to the root issues. As there's no grievance on the table just yet, we do have a window of opportunity to get things back on track informally. On paper, the situation might appear ripe for a group mediation with the director and her team to try and address all of the issues at once. Or maybe a mediation between the director and the employee involved in the recent incident. But are we really getting to the underlying problem by taking that approach? Is it a working relationship that's the issue? Or is that more a symptom of the director's management style? If we really want to get to the heart of this problem and prevent a grievance being raised or anyone else leaving, the team need to see a, a positive difference in the director's behaviour with their own eyes. Otherwise, they will continue to, to leave and to complain about her. So a group mediation at this point might just create an environment, a sort of many-on-one environment, and that's going to leave the director feeling defensive, 
singled out and unsupported. Remember at this point, she doesn't think she's doing anything wrong. So this is where individual coaching can be extremely effective. Once the director has been coached to improve aspects of her behaviour and there's positive feedback being passed on to the CEO, the resolution process can then perhaps be rounded off with, for example, a facilitated team building session that's both re reassuring for everyone, positive and future focused. And this story demonstrates that the primary goal should always be to dig deeper beneath the symptoms until you reach the cause of the conflict and you know what tools you've got available in your armory. It's a great example of where mediation isn't necessarily the best solution. And it goes back to what Robert said about the importance of carrying out an initial needs assessment at the first opportunity. So prevention is better than the cure. Even situations that mediation, that reach mediation, have to some extent already gone too far. It, they've gone beyond the point where the parties and maybe the line manager have been able to reach a resolution themselves. And too often, HR only become aware of the case when it lands on their desk as a grievance. Conflict avoidance, as you'll know, is a natural human tendency, particularly for managers who are unprepared and untrained to handle difficult conversations and yet one that may have very costly consequences for the organisation. So there needs to be that additional focus on your line managers, who unfortunately tend to be the cause of conflict than the resolvers, actually. And in a group context, we've all seen firm managers exhibiting borderline bullying to their direct reports, or those who are trying to deal with um, performance frustrations of their direct reports by setting tighter and tighter deadlines and criticising output. And when they don't see an improvement, they might raise the capability or disciplinary procedure, and it's very possible that the employee are going to raise a grievance in return. And sometimes this can be the first that HR has heard about any issue at all. One of our most popular one-day courses is called Nipping Conflict in the Bud, and it's purely designed for line managers to take ownership over the management of conflict in the business and not turn a blind eye when they're seeing tensions that are brewing between employees while they're still at a right stage for addressing before they perhaps even a need for a mediation, let alone anything more formal. With greater confidence and skill to acknowledge disputes and take a lead role in making sure they're, they're resolved with your line managers, that's when you start to see the entire culture of your business shifting to one that recognises openly uh, conflict and, and prevents conflict as early as possible. I mean, I hope I've made it clear by now at this point in the presentation that it, it just to reiterate, it is about redressing the root cause of employee problems. That really is the key to minimising, and I'll say it bluntly, the financial impact of what employee conflict costs in your organisation. If we could look at it in another way, I'll frame it like this. When the burden of conflict is continually passed up the chain for someone else and someone else to deal with, from informal to formal proceedings and perhaps even onto employment tribunal, at which point it's solicitors who are communicating on behalf of each party. You're getting so far from the emotional core of the business, which is becoming increasingly buried and unresolved, and that's completely in parallel to the escalating cost. It brings us back to the very simple truth that overcoming conflict boils down to meaningful communication and resolution between the parties at the core of it uh, at the earliest possible stage. And finally, working with our clients over the years, you know, we've come across a number of key considerations to bear in mind if you're thinking about introducing mediation into your business. So thinking strategically, we want to think about starting with values. It's really important to be thinking about fostering an organisational culture where everyone accepts that people will have different perspectives, but that everyone expects any conflict to be nipped in the bud early. Your policies and procedures need to be clear, they need to be accessible, unintimidating and in complete alignment with messages from leadership and in your training. 
brief all staff members on the content of your policy, from when and why mediation should be employed, to helping them understand uh, certain definitions, such as what exactly constitutes bullying and harassment, and to whom they can turn to when tensions boil over. Everybody should be clear on what is and what isn't acceptable behaviour in your business. Educate your line managers. These people are ideally placed to take ownership of conflict prevention and resolution, which may prevent many cases escalating to formal procedures. And it's training that's really essential here to giving them the skills and confidence to tackle awkward situations. Little and often, we need to disseminate company-wide information on a regular basis to keep employees informed, involved and up to date. And finally, prove it. It's really important to be able to demonstrate the business case of using mediation to the board after you've done a handful of uh, successful cases. Okay, that's the main presentation over. I hope you found that useful. And as I said, you will be receiving the recording, a link to the recording um, in due course. What we'd like to do with our final 15 to 20 minutes is to uh, talk about some of the questions that have come through. We've had some really, really interesting questions. Um, so I would, um, as, as the chair of the panel, um, also someone who will be answering questions, I'd like to start with a question for Linda. Um, very, very straightforward question. I think it makes a lot of sense. When is mediation not appropriate? Over to you, Linda. Thanks, Natalia. Um, yes, there are a number of situations. It's not, not always appropriate. Um, and that means that we can't stress strongly enough, of course, that someone needs to assess the situation carefully beforehand, whether it's a line manager or someone in it, HR. And of course, good mediators also double check before the beginning of a mediation that it is appropriate in this situation. But for example, when the parties are not the best ones to be resolving the issues, a simple little situation where the shift pattern is causing trouble and needs to be changed and it's not their responsibility. There has to be a, a, a different solution to that problem and it's not a mediation. Uh, when another solution is best, as Natalia has already said, offering training or coaching to one or both parties, it might be much more appropriate than offering mediation or offering it straight away. Um, when it's clear that one or other of the parties is only taking part to avoid a grievance and is not committed to any resolution. Uh, we may have all seen some of those situations. And when one or both parties have those mental health issues which would make it difficult for them to stick to any agreements made in the mediation. I'm not talking about all mental health issues, just there are some around where someone will agree to something in a mediation meeting and then forget about it immediately afterwards. Um, another situation might be when one or other of the parties is very anxious or scared of being exposed to the other and protections have been discussed and have been discussed as insufficient, then you wouldn't go ahead. You have to consider the needs of everyone. And where the behaviour complained about is very serious. Uh, we had a situation once where the complaining person said she would be prepared to give mediation a chance. Uh, it was her suggestion, in fact. But actually, she was complaining that there was a possible rape in the workplace. And it is, I'm sure you will agree, inappropriate to expect this complaining party to carry the responsibility for the organisation, which of course has an obligation to investigate instead and take action in the light of the evidence. So that in that situation, in spite of what the complaining person was saying, you wouldn't go forward with a mediation. Those are just a few of the situations, but again, um, I go back to the situation, to the, the comment where we need to assess very carefully. Lots of situations are appropriate for mediation, and I wouldn't like those exceptions to put you off, but they do need to be said. Thank you. Back to you, Natalia. Thanks, Linda. Um, we've got a question, I think, for Robert. Um, Robert introduced the concept of mediation um, earlier in the presentation, so I think this one's a good one for him. When can mediation be used? Over to you, Robert. Thanks, Natalia. <coughs> mediation can be used at many different stages of the conflict process. 
informal, during the early stages of a dispute, mediation can be used as a highly effective intervention to resolve conflict. At this stage, the mediation is entirely voluntary and confidential, involving an independent, impartial person, the mediator, helping two or more participants or groups to reach a positive solution acceptable to all. And the focus here is on restoring relationships and then moving forward. Mediation can also be considered at the formal stage, providing, of course, as was mentioned earlier, that all parties are willing to put that formal process on hold. Mediation here follows the same principles as the informal stage. And then post-formal. Far too often, following a grievance or disciplinary case, the parties involved are in need of mediation support to help them integrate back into the workplace. This is a very effective support process which can include a more formal approach to the sharing of agreements reached by participants. Okay, Natalia, I'll hand back to you now. Okay, thanks, Robert. Uh, just to clear up a very quick question that's been asked, um, will the slides be available? Yes, as well as a recording, uh, we'll be sending you um, a link to download these uh, presentation slides. Um, a question's come through from Sarah, which is, that says, coaching's an expensive option. Is it really more effective than a mediation? Um, I'll take that one, which uh, really goes back to addressing conflict at the earliest possible stage for me. I mean, if we're talking about a situation uh, that, like we had with the finance director earlier, uh, which was more about targeting her ineffective management style, then, then coaching is very well placed for that type of situation. I mean, in an ideal world, we'd be able to offer each and every employee business coaching to work on their individual gaps. But we know that in reality, it, it tends to be considered more for uh, senior level staff or really anyone who's got a bigger impact, um, whose actions and decisions have a bigger impact within the company. Um, and therefore, it's paramount that, that those are coming across positively. We've actually found coaching to work really, really well for um, you'll probably recognize these types, the senior managers and directors who have maybe been uh, behaving and communicating and managing the way they have for many years, um, during which time they've never been challenged on their behavior. And it's surprising what, and that really is, that really is then the root cause there because it's been, it's been entrenched for so long. Um, and it can be surprising how a, only a short series of coaching sessions um, for potentially uh, a similar cost to maybe a one-day mediation, maybe all that's needed to start to encourage that individual to self-reflect and to be given some techniques to modify the way they communicate with colleagues. And that can be extremely effective and then reduce the need for, say, mediations coming up in future. Of course, it's really critical to have budget at the forefront of your mind. We, we understand that more than anyone. Um, but it is worth saying that sometimes there is a business case for spending maybe a little bit extra on tackling the real root cause to bring about long-term change than it is to try and put a less expensive plaster over the situation, over the symptom, um, because you're only going to have that problem rearing its head again in the future in, in maybe a more costly way. So, yeah, I hope that helps. Um, okay, moving on to a, a really interesting question um, from Karen. Um, She's really interested to know how a mediator might approach a situation where an employee wants to enter into a mediation, uh, but the, their line manager doesn't believe that there is actually a breakdown in the relationship. Um, they think it's just a way for the employee to get out of being managed to performance. Um, she knows that mediation is voluntary and not appropriate in all cases. Is this an example of that, or is there something else to consider? It's a great question, and I'm going to hand over to Linda. Thanks, Natalia. Yes, a lot of issues to consider there, Karen. Um, we go back to assessing it very carefully, um, and someone from HR is well placed here um, to double check why the employee thinks mediation is appropriate in this situation. What does the individual want to raise in mediation? It draws my attention to a question for you, whether you have an appeals component to your 
uh, performance reviews uh, because if you do sometimes it's better for uh, the issue to be raised as an appeal and dealt with that might be on more practical matters for example um, is there a risk I would ask you that the employee is thinking of submitting a formal grievance if nothing is done about the manager's behavior perhaps um, in which case the organization might consider allowing a mediation as a more cost-effective solution and the manager might be more uh, uh, amenable to taking part. Uh, is the manager perhaps uh, worried about his role being undermined as having the right to uh, conduct performance reviews and to require improved performance? He can of course be reassured on this um, and that by, by taking part in a mediation he doesn't undermine his position at all. Um, we also need to respect the fact that mediation need not just be about relationships. We've emphasized that a bit today, um, and it's especially good for relationships, but it also might resolve some disagreements that they might have, perhaps on the performance criteria that have been chosen for the employee, or how um, things are measured, and that, that might free up a more constructive performance review discussion later. So there are quite a number of issues here. I'd love to talk to you offline about this, um, but um, it all gets back, doesn't it, to assessing the situation and what is the best way forward. Perhaps I'll leave it there for a minute, but happy to come back and discuss that at any time, Karen. Back to you now. Thanks, Linda. And I've got a kind of related question here, which is um, for Robert to answer, and it's, it's how do you deal with both participants when neither wants to go to mediation. Over to you. Okay, Natalia, thanks for that. Yep. Um, just trying to find the right button, button to press. Digital dyslexia, as I describe it. Um, all parties need to know that they're welcome to leave after the initial one-to-one -one meeting with the mediator um, if they want to. You know, it is voluntary, uh, so any feelings of pressure and expectation are kept to the absolute minimum. It's important to let them know who is available to contact the mediation, that they've been trained in mediation, and selected to ensure that they have no vested interest whatsoever in the outcome of this particular situation. Impartiality is absolutely critical to the whole process. Being clear, informative, and reassuring can prompt even the most reticent party to give mediation a try, although sometimes no amount of persuasion will deter an individual from wanting a more formal approach. Once any formal claims have been investigated and procedures exhausted, the parties, probably in a different mental place altogether, may need to be able to work together again and mediation can then be used to very great effect. Back to you Natalia. Thanks Robert. Okay, coming, coming up to our last few questions um, in order to finish by four. Um, I had a question come through which is how do you teach managers to address conflict earlier and to, to nip it in the bud? Um, really interesting question. What we do with our training programs is to really, really get across the premise that everyone in the organization has a role in preventing and reducing workplace conflict. It's, it's very, very common to hear that um, the buck just keeps getting passed to HR, um, that the problem of conflict just keeps getting passed to HR uh, uh, once it's already uh, kind of spilled out over the edge uh, and become more difficult to deal with. So, we really want to get managers and non-managers to, to think about their own behavior, to think about what um, their own trigger points are um, so that they can actively avoid getting into conflict in the first place. Um, so it's really about giving them, giving them a sense of uh, accountability, responsibility, and, and the tools um, on a very practical level to be able to adapt their style to other styles. Um, because even an understanding of how others are operating differently to you can be enough to eliminate or prevent future tension. And our training actually also covers what happens when conflict does arise. 
uh, as inevitably it will, although hopefully less so, um, because it gives learners the confidence to resolve it through informal communication and effective, more effective communica uh, com conversations than they're having. And this is where we start to see organisations move towards a whole culture of lower conflict. Um, that could be measured by number of grievances, for example. Um, and they're also going to be, it's also going to be a culture of higher motivation, higher performance, um, and other metrics such as lower absenteeism are things that you're going to notice. Okay, um, we just have time for one more question, which is for Linda, and that is, when would two mediators be appropriate? Over to you, Linda. Hi, thank you. Yes, this is useful to know, especially if you are budget holders um, and need to know when a second mediator might be a good idea. Certainly, I think we can all guess that if the dynamics are known to be very difficult between the parties, that it's emotionally charged or potentially violent even, then a second mediator would be a very good idea for safety's sake, among other things. Um, another situation might be when shuttle mediation might be an option. Some of you may have heard of this, but sometimes one of the parties is too nervous to be in the same room as the other party, to begin with at least, and so two rooms are needed and the mediators move between the two until the parties feel comfortable at being in the same room. And you do need two mediators for that process, well, usually. Um, when it's a team mediation, of course, um, it's important that two people watch the complex dynamics in the group and also that a subgroup can resolve an issue in another room if required. Um, another situation might be where there are mental health issues, those which do not prevent the mediation going ahead but may need skill to be managed carefully. For example, depression, as we know, and bipolar conditions are common at work and we need to manage them rather than avoid them. However, it is safer to have two mediators in case someone needs to leave the room or take time out. And if one of the mediators has a clinical or psychological qualification, so much the better. Um, I'm also aware that there are certain cultural issues which are actually the focus for the mediation itself. And where this is the case, it's sometimes useful to have a second mediator who reflects the culture um, and demonstrates an understanding for the parties. So there are a number of situations where two mediators might be appropriate, and I'm sure mediators will give you a whole host more. Um, usually, one mediator can cope with two people. When it starts getting more complex, then you need to consider having a second present. Thanks, Natalia. Thanks, Linda. Um, that brings us to the end of the... Uh of the Q&A and indeed to the, to the end of the webcast. So um, just a final few things to mention. Uh, thanks, first of all, for uh, coming on board on the webcast and, and uh, hearing us present. Really hope you've had, uh, found something useful to take away from the webcast. And we've really enjoyed sharing our, our expertise. Um, it's been a long time coming because we're, we're summarizing um, probably a decade's worth of mediation experience into this webcast and indeed into the guide that's coming, which I've mentioned. So um, we didn't actually get the chance to go through all of the questions that came through. Um, for example, there was a really good good one on why mediations can fail, um, probably too long to cover in the next uh, 30 seconds. So what we're gonna do is answer those over into our LinkedIn group. We've got, um, if, you, if you look at uh, people resolutions as a company, um, you can search for the group via that route or just search for the group People Resolutions Webcasts. Um, and that's where we'll be uh, highlighting some of those final questions and what our thoughts are. Maybe even your thoughts as well if you want to chip in. Um, so head on over there uh, shortly after uh, the webcast. So just leaves me to thank you and also to say that um, if at any time you just want to talk through any kind of conflict situation, um, Use us. Feel free. You know, feel free to use us as a sounding board um, or as a sort of critical friend. You know, to have a look at your your problem with fresh pair of eyes, with our conflict expertise, and just to talk it through. We know how how helpful that can be uh, when you're wrestling with a with a real headache of a situation. So, um, have a look at our website, peopleresolutions.com. Um, some of you are existing clients already, and some of you we haven't spoken to. 
but whichever one you are, really looking forward to speaking to you soon. So thanks everyone for coming. Bye.